We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning. Welcome to ACC. You've seen me up here already for the last like what, 15 minutes, but uh, I'm ready to still have a good time. I got a little bit of voice left, so uh, if I start to get a little hoarse, it's because I just sang for a while, but it, it's going to work out because God always works things out for the good of those who love Him, like, like we were talking about earlier. But listen, if we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Mike Miller. I'm the executive pastor of Worship Arts here at ACC, um, and I, I just want to say thank you for choosing to be with us and worship here uh, on Father's Day. Speaking of Father's Day, I too want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room watching online or in the lounge if you're down there. Um, I, listen, I've never had, I've never felt like I have had the gift of prophecy, uh, but I believe that the Lord has given me a word to speak to all the fathers in the room right now. And it's very serious. So uh, wives, you need to hear this too, because it's super important. The Lord has told me to tell all the fathers in this room, when you get home, there will be a brand new Traeger waiting for you. <laughs> and wives, I didn't say it, God did, so don't make me a liar. Don't make God a liar, okay? Just throwing that out. Or if you already have a Traeger, maybe a motorcycle or something cool. I tried to do that. Michelle said no. So I don't have a motorcycle. But anyways, uh, listen, we're in week three of asking for a friend. And uh, the first two weeks were amazing. Who liked Pastor Rick's energy? His whispering to the loud screams were amazing for our speakers. Uh, for, I mean, just in general, the message was incredible. Pa uh, Wesley Bolin was incredible as well last week. And today we are talking about the, the question we are answering is, how do we know the Bible is true? So I want you to go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles if you have them with you. If you don't have them with you, there's a Bible on the back seat that you can have if you don't have one. We want that to be a gift to you. But turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3 and hold your finger there. And the question we are asking, like I said, is how do we know the Bible is true? While you guys turn there or get ready for the message, I'm going to go ahead and say a quick prayer and then we'll get into it. So Father, we love you. God, we love your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to us, uh, reveal to our human eyes uh, that your words, what your words are in the Bible, Father, that reveal to us what we need to know to understand that your Bible, your words are the absolute truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've heard this question asked a lot over my life. Throughout my whole life, I've heard the question asked, how do you know the Bible's true? How do you know the Bible's true? And I've never had like a solid answer to give to someone because I've never heard a solid answer from people. I've been around, you know, pastors and been around other ministry leaders and been around other Christians my whole life. And the answer I always get is something, something like super superficial and super like easy. And, and, and you know, they just say like, oh, you just got to have faith. The Bible's true because, you know, the Bible is the Bible. Things like that. And I'm always like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And with that in mind, I do want to jump into point number one because it is a plain and simple answer. It's somewhat one of those tongue-in-cheek things, you know. Uh, it, but it gets the typical Christianese answer out of the way. And so with that point in mind, I want, I, want to re I want you to remember this. I want to remind you, some of you or many of you are Christians. I'm a believer myself. Some of you may not be, uh, but this particular point is for the believer it, because, because of, you know, like I said, a lot of people would, would say things like, oh, you know, the Bible is true because of faith. So I do want to tell you what faith actually is. Faith is defined as the confidence of trust in a person or thing. And another definition is belief that is not based on proof. And I believe that we actually have plenty of proof. It's also defined in the Bible in Hebrews 11.1. 1, it says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And some translations use the word assurance. Some use conviction or both, meaning we ought to believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God simply because we know that we, we serve a God, that, a God that is powerful, a God that is loving. 
and who never lies to us. He's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. All, the, all just the, the characteristics of God. But if you can't believe that because of your hope and because of your love for Christ or your faith in God, then hopefully you can believe it because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your lives. But the first point is for the believers in Jesus. And then we'll get on to some logical explanations with some facts and some other things. But I'm going to keep all of the points super, super easy to remember. They're so easy to remember that you probably will walk out of here being able to, to say all three of them just like that. Uh, point number one is because the Bible says so. It's that tongue-in-cheek thing I was talking about. The Bible says so. I know it may sound crazy, maybe corny or lame or something to some of you, but you might be thinking, you know, I, I guess if I say I'm tan, buff, and handsome, then that means I'm tan, buff, and handsome. At least my wife thinks so. I don't know. Sorry for the other guys. My wife thinks that. Maybe that's a bad example. Uh, you might be, it might be in your head, you might be thinking like, okay, maybe he's saying stuff like, or he's, he's saying this in a way that means like, uh, you know, if I sit in a, in a garage overnight, that maybe I, I'm a car. I'm, I'm not saying it in, in that way. What I'm saying is from a young age, uh, I can remember a very simple song that was taught to me when I was a baby, and it even says it in there. It says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, do you remember what, what it says at the end? Can we all sing it together? It says, the Bible tells me, yes. So you might be, what, what I'm saying here is that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So if you believe in Jesus, then you believe the Bible is the Word of God. Jesus actually verifies the Bible is true. He, he quotes from three-fourths of the Bible or of the Old Testament while he's speaking in the New Testament. So, you know, there's 39 books of the Old Testament. From 29 to 30 of those books, while he's talking throughout his life, what we read about in the New Testament, he quotes from 29 to 30 of those books. So he is verifying the authenticity of the Bible as he speaks to people and as we get to read about it. Do you remember a lot of what he, what he says when he quotes the Old Testament? He says, uh, he says the Scriptures say... And you might not think that's a big deal because he, he always says the scriptures say, the scriptures say. You might not think it's a huge deal, but it actually is because the word scripture actually means inspired writings. Did you know that? It means inspired writing. That's where we get the word scripture from. It means inspired writing. So every time Jesus was saying in the New Testament, when you scroll through there and you, or you read through it, every time he's saying the scriptures say, he's saying the inspired writings say. And you might be thinking, well, who are they inspired by? Well, they're inspired by God. I'm going to show you that. In 2 Timothy, where you were holding your finger at, in 2 Timothy 3.16, says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the New King James Version says it like this. It uses five different words than what we just read, but it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And those five words uh, in the Greek is actually theop. Theopneustos, Theopneustos. I had to practice how to say that because I'm not Greek. Theopneustos. But here's a little Greek lesson. The, the first four letters, Theo, actually means, in the Greek, it means God. And then the neustos means breathe. It's kind of like a, you know, the, the new, P-N-E-U. It, it comes from pneuma, which means breath, or it's referring to air. It's kind of like when you're, when you're thinking about uh, pneumatic tools, right? Pneumatic drills, all that kind of stuff. They don't run off of of power. They run off of air, right? Or if you're, if you're not into tools and you're into the medical field and, and weird things like that, the stuff that's going on with your body. Pneumonia is referring to your air. You know, the first, what, I don't know, two months that I was here in, in Maryland, uh, just a couple years ago when I first got to ACC, I struggled with my breath, with feeling like I was getting enough air uh, for a couple of months. I was miserable. I had pneumonia and bronchitis at the same stinking time. And, uh, and so, you know, pneuma is referring to air. So theopneustos means God breathed. And what this actually, what, what, what it means is that according to 2 Timothy 3.16, as the NIV has said it, the way that that translation said it, all scripture is God breathed. And that's why it used that phrase. And that's how we know the Bible is true. If you think about it, if you, if you go to your Bible and you turn in the very beginning, past all the table of contents, past all the you know, who wrote this and who wrote that and who signed off on this Bible and all that kind of stuff. You can't pa pass all that to Genesis 1. It, it says this. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and the darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. 
And then in verse 3, it, start, it starts. It says, then God said. And then God said. Over and over again, you read that phrase, God said. God said, right? God said, let there be light. God said, let there be space between the waters. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Ten times in Genesis 1, did you know if you, re- if you really look carefully, ten times you'll see the phrase God said. Fifteen times you'll read, let there be. So when you speak, you breathe. So I want to do a little exercise with you. I want you to take your hand real quick. Let's say your right hand for, just for the sake of it because, you know, it's, it's cool to choose your right hand, I guess. I don't know. The left hand, whatever. Right hand's better. Take it and put it over your mouth. Turn to your neighbor and say, I don't want to smell your breath. <laughs> and turn to your other neighbor and say the same thing. I don't want to smell yours either. When you speak, you feel something, right? You felt it on your hand. You feel the air, your breath. And every time you open, the mouth, every time you open your mouth to speak, you breathe. You can't speak without it. When God speaks, he also breathes and things come to life. Every time God opened his mouth, his words brought life. My favorite is in Genesis 2, 7, it says, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. Isn't that cool? You know, God's word, the the word, the Bible that we're speaking of today, right now, it's alive and breathing, I tell you. 2 Peter 1, 20, verses through 21, it says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No Those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. So in this context, it says says prophecy, right? It's it's talking about actual scripture being written by God. So the writers wrote as God spoke. They wrote as the Spirit moved, is what this scripture is saying, as the Spirit moved and God spoke to them. We actually have the written word of God. This is the, the literal written word of God. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that I said it's written, because that's super important. Can you imagine going to buy a car and then driving off the lot, or maybe it's deliver, like Carvana or those other weird things, you know, like maybe it's delivered to you, and you get to drive off, but you never signed anything. So now you have this car that's kind of out in limbo. You, you have no signature. Or even, or even kind of worse than that, have you ever thought about the idea of buying a house, but it not be in writing? I'd want a contract in writing to know that my stuff is my stuff, and that no one has access to what's mine, right? It's important that it's in writing. Even in my marriage, I can remember a time early on in marriage, you know, my wife was like, I, you know, don't buy me flowers for my, for my birthday, for Mother's Day, for, for whatever, anything. Don't ever buy me flowers. They're, they just die. They're a waste. Give me something that I really want. And then, of course, you know, those holidays come around and other wives are at work around her getting flowers. And, and then I get home and I'm getting the brunt end of it. I'm getting beat up and stuff. And I'm like screaming and crying. But you, you said don't buy. I should have got it in writing. That just made it worse. Don't, don't ever say that. <laughs> Writing is important, right? Uh, I heard a story of a doctoral student. Uh, I had the pleasure of going, not to my doc, for my doctorate, but for in graduate school. And all graduate schools kind of like this. But he, he was writing his dissertation. And when you write in graduate school, everything that you write has to be documented, right? So uh, he didn't like this rule. So he was like, I'm going to do it my way. Um, so whenever he wrote something, he would write a really great statement, and he'd put on the paper, or he'd you know, type it up probably, but however he was writing, he put, on, he put down, uh, as, as spoken by, or as, or as told to me by the, the waiter or waitress at XYZ Restaurant. And then he would keep writing, make another quote, and follow up by, as told to me by so-and-so. So over time, one of the professors that was working with him was like, hey, man, you can't do that. Everything that you write it needs to be documented. You have to have proof of it. Uh, for it to be valid in your paper. And he was like, why? I don't understand why it's so important that it's in writing. I don't understand why this written source is more important than this verbal source. And so the professor was like, all right, man, I see where you're going with it. Just do your thing. That's fine. So then later on, you know, he finished his dissertation. He turned it in, and he thought all was well. A couple of weeks later, the professor called him and was like, hey, man, I just want to congratulate you. You're getting your doctorate. You passed. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. And then he goes, but I do have to tell you, you'll have to take our word for it. We're not putting it in writing. We're not giving you a a diploma. (laughs) And all of a sudden he realizes it's important. My point is is that it's important that this is in writing. It's important to note and and remember that this is the written word of God. Really what I'm saying when I say point number one was because the Bible says so, 
What I really mean is because it's written. It's written, it's been verified, it's been authenticated, and that could have only happened if it was written. So point number two, another thing to remember that it's super simple to remember, another way to remember it is that point number two is because it's amazing. The Bible is amazing. So many things in this Bible that I, that I have read that I can read over and over again, just one particular verse, you know, I could read it days in a row, and almost every time I, I learn something new from it, a new revelation will come from it. But let's take a moment. I want to compare the Bible to the Koran and to Buddhist teachings, not to be like argumentative, not to, not to offend people, not to try to put anyone down who follows Buddhist teachings or who, who considers himself to be a Muslim. I just want to compare a couple of facts for a moment. The fact of, of each of these is that, you know, Buddhist sayings are from one man, right? Muhammad, the Quran, the Quran was written by one man. The, the sayings in the, in the Quran are from one man, that's Muhammad. And they're written from the time that he was the age 40 till he died at 63. But they were sayings that he, that he said, and they, they were put together by scribes and scholars after Muhammad was, di- was dead, after he died. And the fact is about it is that both of these, both of these uh, writings were from one man. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, is written by 40 different men over the course of over 1,500 years, or around 1,500 years. Now, we know this based on studies that the Bible was, was uh, written from 1,450 to 1,480 B.C., and it went on to about 70 A.D. So the collusion factor alone, just of them writing all of this over that long of a period of time, that's amazing. But what really amazes me is that knowing the fact that over 1,500 years and that many different writers... They were writing, you know, for, for 1,500 years, yet there's a single thread, a common denominator that runs from the very beginning of it to the very end of it. And that just amazes me. And what amazes me even more about it is that in all of that, there's zero discrepancies, and you can't prove that there's any. And that can only happen if it's an inspired, a divinely inspired book that's inspired by God. And I think, you know, if it was like 40 different writers over the course of 20 years or maybe 30 years, like one lifespan each, maybe there could be some cohesiveness or some similarities, right? But 1,500 years, 40 different writers, there's no way. I mean, just look at culture today. How much has things changed since COVID? Can I say that word online? How much has things changed since that stuff started? How much has things changed since five years ago? Or even yesterday, things have changed since then. If you watch the news at all, I avoid it because of that. But things change every single day. And yet in 1,500 years, you know, they had such similarities and such cohesiveness in all of the writings. So let's, let's talk about some of the facts that, that I promised you. Isaiah, in the Bible, Isaiah talks about the virgin birth 700 years before it happens. Micah, 700 years before it happens, tells us the city in which Jesus would be born. Zechariah describes the death of Jesus in detail. David describes crucifixion 1,000 years before Christ. The weird thing about it is that the first crucifixion didn't happen until 497 B.C. So that crucifixion wasn't even a thing whenever he wrote about it. So 500 years before crucifixion ever existed, he wrote about it. And he also talked about uh, the, the gambling of Jesus' clothing whenever he was, whenever he was uh, uh, you know, crucified, uh, 1,000 years before Christ. Now, Daniel talked about, uh, around 500 B.C., Daniel talks about an empire that will rise up, cover the earth, and then will be suddenly cut off. It'll turn into four empires, and then two, and then one empire, and then during that one empire, the last one, is when Jesus would be born, right? The Messiah would be born. So I'm going to break that one down real quick. 300 B.C., 300 years before Christ, 200 years after Daniel prophesied this, Alexander the Great. Do y'all remember him from history class? Alexander the Great, he was the thing. He was the the guy. At 32 years old, he died. So his four generals turned, uh, turned into the four rulers of the empires. Two of the generals were considered to be strong rulers. Two of them were considered to be weak. A lot of wars happened. And they became the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid empires. And then all of some more stuff happened, and essentially it became the Roman Empire. And that's when Jesus was born. All of this is history. It's factual history that you find in history books. You can ask history scholars. You can ask history buffs. You can ask, you can look, you can, I mean, Google it. Google is the best history teacher, right? Google it. You'll find out that this is all proven factual history 
There are unbelievers who are experts in these different areas who don't even believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the Bible, who say that the mathematical odds of Daniel's prophecy happening are astronomical. They're huge. They're, they're just ridiculously huge. But the prophecies were accurate. And how, how could that be? Because the Bible says so. It, it, that's, it's, and, and it proves it in amazing ways. The Bible is amazing in it, all of itself. But, like, I mean, the facts of the history, they all add up. That's how you know the Bible's true. So the real question that I really want to ask is how do you know the Bible's not true? I mean, everything that we've talked about so far proves it should be true. So if you, if you would think that if the Bible, put it like this, if the Bible could be proven false at any given time, you would find somewhere in the Bible where the Bible would be like, you know, this city was named blah, 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 but then all the history stuff and all the scientific proof behind things would say that it was named something differently. Or they'd say stuff like, this city was 500 miles from this one, but in reality it's 100. That never happened. Neither of those things happened. Those types of things never have happened. The details, the facts that are in the Bible have never been falsified. They've, there have been attempts to falsify it, but it's never came back to be proven uh, false. It's all been accurate. So 2,000 years before, or 2,000 years since Christ, 3,500 years since the inscripturation process began, the Bible has been more studied than any other book in history. It's also been more scrutinized than any other book in history, but it's never been falsified, and it never will be. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes. Dr. Bruce Metzger, he's a Princeton Theological Seminary professor, said, it is safe for any scholar to say that 99.6 of the Bible has been corroborated by, any, by other historical documents. So 99.6 have been confirmed by historical documents. Remember what we talked about earlier, 1,500 years, 40 different writers. Right? So Voltaire, he reminds me of that, that one movie. I've never watched it, but Voldemir or whatever the weird guy, no nose, kind of reminds me of that. But he's a French philosopher. He had made the statement that in 100 years from whenever he made the statement, 100 years the Bible will be a forgotten book. Let me tell you what happened with Voltaire. A hundred years later, the Bible was still there. Uh, his house was owned by the French Bible Society, and he was dead. Not to say that he died because he made that statement, but it's pretty ironic. Dr. Peter Stoner is a professor emeritus of science at Westmont College. Note, I did not say a theological seminary professor. He is a science professor he decided he liked to take a shot at the Bible about proving that it's false, right? So he decided to do a study with 600 students, and this is crazy. The findings of his study were actually found, were, were, were uh, marked off as accurate and verified by the ASA, the American Scientific Affiliation. And I want, you to, I want to remind you, Dr. Stoner and the ASA are not Christian organizations. Uh, the study was trying to find the mathematical odds that Jesus fulfilled all of the Messianic prophecies. There are 53 of them spread out over 300 references in the Bible. Some say that there's 300 messianic prophecies. Some say 353. Some have some weird numbers. What I have found to be true after studying it is that there are 53 referenced in about 300 places, and it was too daunting for them to figure this out. It's too just difficult to, like, they couldn't do it in their minds. And so they decided, let's take the eight, let's take eight of them. Let's take the first eight prophecies that we see, uh, eight prophecies that history has verified that Jesus fulfilled. Let's do the odds for those. So essentially, they took the New Testament out of the equation. They took eight Old Testament Jewish scripture messianic prophecies, right, that Jesus fulfilled and that history has already proven. And the mathematical odds for this were just, wow, just astounding. They're mind-blowing. So they, what they found was that 1 in 10 to the 17th power was the, was the findings. Can anyone do that in their head? I can't. We're going to look at it on the screen. I just know that when I saw this number, I was like, I'd like a $100 bill in my wallet. A hundred quadrillion would be awesome. If I had a hundred quadrillion, this is what the number looks like, I'd buy you all a tank of gas. <laughs> I, think, I think that'd be enough. Maybe for not the second service, though, just the first service. So to, to, be act to actually be able to picture this, I want to put it into a different like, geographical perspective. I'm from Texas, the best country in the world, right? You know, we're a very proud state, if you haven't noticed. It's, we like to tell people when we're from Texas, we tell everybody. It's kind of like CrossFitters. We tell people these things. Texas is big. It's huge. It's obviously superior. Uh, but you can start driving in Texas at sunrise and keep driving until the sun is completely out of sight, out of the sky, and you'll still be in Texas. That's how Texas works. It's weird. But if you took a silver dollar, 
and you put it down in the middle of Texas, and then you start surrounding it edge to edge with more silver dollars, right, until you cover the entire state of Texas. And then you have to go back and keep stacking them until it's two feet high, so like up to my knees or so. That would be, one, or that would be 10 to the 17th power. And let's just say, hypothetically, you took a random silver dollar while you were stacking, and you marked it, put a little X on it with a Sharpie, and you put it randomly somewhere in the state of Texas in, in one of those stacks, you know, one of those stacks. That's now one in 10 to the 17th power. That's how, you know, the one silver dollar. Now, more perspective here. You did that, and then you said, all right, I'm going to take one random person. I'm going to blindfold you. I'm going to helicopter you, drop you in the middle of Texas, in the middle of nowhere, because that's what a lot of Texas is, actually. It's the middle of nowhere. Drop them in the middle somewhere, and then say, you can walk wherever you want to walk. You can walk this way, that way, north, south, east, west, whatever. Whatever way you walk, don't unblindfold un yourself. Just stay blindfold. Just keep walking. And then whenever you feel like it, pick up a coin from anywhere in the stack, anywhere, wherever you're standing. The, the, the odds that he would pick up the one that was marked, that's the odds we're talking about here. That's the odds that Jesus fulfilled eight of the Messianic prophecies, let alone 53, Right? And these are just the ones that history has already proven. Remember I said point number two was that the Bible is true because it's amazing. And I'd add, it's amazing with proof. Biblical, historical, scientific, and mathematical at this point. Point number three today is, how do we know the Bible is true? It's because I know the author personally. And listen, you can know him too. And if you don't know him, we want you to. And you might be thinking, Pastor Mike, you said there were 40 authors Actually, I didn't say that. I said there were 40 writers, but there's only one author. There's only one author. The author is God. 40 different men over 1,500 years could not have written this book and it be as cohesive as it is. They couldn't have written, it out, written this book without any discrepancies. And it just proves there's only one author. Listen, God is a God of order, and a God of order cannot be inconsistent and cannot be chaotic in anything that he does. One author used 40 different men, and they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible can be summed up in one idea, one person, one thing, by the way. All of these things that we're talking about, the single thread, you remember I'd mentioned 1,500 years, 40 different writers, there's a single thread that goes through it all. That single thread, that common denominator in it all, is Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. Every person in the room whether you're watching online, you're at your house, you're in the lounge, wherever you are at, every person that was created, ever created, was created with a void in them that only Jesus could fill. It actually says this in John 5, 3. It says, you search the scriptures because you know they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. So Jesus himself verifies the Bible, and he talks about these scriptures throughout the Old and the New Testament, and you can see the common thread as you read it all. If he had been a charlatan, you know what a charlatan is? It's a person that's like falsely claiming to be something they're not. If he was a charlatan, he could have made one statement, a single statement differently, and it would have blew it all. He could have said that he would rise from the grave spiritually. Because then at that point, when his, when his bones weren't there, when his body wasn't there, he could have said, oh, you know, we, well, we could have said, it's just, he, he said that he was going to raise spiritually. It's just a metaphor. But the good news is that Jesus isn't a charlatan. He's not falsely trying to prove himself to be something that he's not. He, he didn't say that he would rise from the grave spiritually. He said he would do it bodily, and he did. 2,000 years, I'll tell you, 2,000 years from the time that Muhammad died, his remains were still in the grave. They're still in the tomb. They were found. Buddhist remains were still in the tomb. Over 2,000 years, the scientific facts state that no archaeologists have ever found Jesus' remains. They've never found the body of Jesus Christ. It's not because he isn't real. Everyone knows he's real. Everyone knows he was on earth. Even other religions admit it. I, I've heard even atheists tell me that Jesus was a real person, an actual person. It's not because he didn't die and, and, and rise from the grave. As a human, if you think about it, as a person, a human body, at some point, the man would have had to die. If you read the scriptures, it says that there was a Roman spear through his heart. The guy died, but his body was never found. His remains would have been found otherwise. The fact is that he said that he would rise from the grave bodily, 
and he did. So I'm going to give you seven questions that I want you to, to jot down real quick. We're going to fly through them, but you can take a picture of them if you want. But these seven questions is how, uh, how do you know the Bible is true? The Bible in and of itself, the predictions, the prophecies, all of it, it proves it, all in history and science and everything. Question number one is how did he arrange to be born into a specific family? You can see that in 2 Samuel 7. How did he arrange to be born into a specific city in which his parents didn't even live? How did he arrange his own death, and specifically by crucifixion between two criminals? How did he arrange to have his executioners gamble for his clothing? How did he arrange to be betrayed in advance and be crucified on the exact day that Jews sacrificed a spotless lamb for their sins? How did he arrange to have the executioners break the legs of the two victims on each side, but not his own? And the last question is, how did he arrange to come back to life on the exact day that he said he would? Ultimately, when you ask these questions, while we have historical and scientific and biblical facts to prove a lot of things in the Bible, the answer to all of the questions, even the questions we can't seem to figure out, can be summed up in three words. Three words. Because he's God because he's God. So how do we know the Bible is true? Point number one was the Bible says so. Number two is because it's amazing and history and science prove it beautifully. Point number three is because we know the author. So like we end all of our services here, we always ask this question and I want you to ask the question to yourself. What now, God? What do I do with all this information? Listen, I want to challenge you. If you're doubting the validity of the word of God, if you have any doubts that God spoke these words that the 40 men wrote down, that's okay. I understand. I understand doubt wholeheartedly. I understand that doubt can cause you to be fearful. I understand that doubt can cause you to question a lot of things about what's ahead or even what's in the past. But know this, God isn't afraid of your doubt. He's not afraid of your fear. And it's because when you start searching through the answers, when you start sifting through the word of God, the single thread that you're going to see, every part of these, uh, of these books, every part of this Bible will point to Jesus. And ultimately, Jesus is the answer to your doubt. He's the answer to your fear. He's the answer to your anxiety. All the things that you're worrying about, he's, your, he's the answer. The cool thing about it is that there's even scriptures. I'm going to tell you one of them. There, there's something that God left in there, a little nugget in there for whenever you're feeling anxious, whenever you're feeling all these things, if you're doubting what the Word says. The Bible says in 1 Peter to cast all your cares on Him because He loves you. And in the end, what He wants you to know from, from His book, from this Word, is that He loves you and His Son, Jesus, died on the cross from you, for you. And He wants to show you that love and He wants to save you from your sins to bring you closer to Him. If you're sitting in this room or in the lounge or you're watching online, and you're thinking, Pastor Michael, I don't know this love, but I want it. I want to know Christ. I want to be closer to him. Or maybe in your heart, you've come to the realization that the word of God is alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, just like it says in his word. And you want Jesus to be the savior of your life. Look, I want you to come up here and we'll pray with you. I want you to find someone after service. We'll pray with you. And then I want to encourage you to take the next step and be baptized. We have everything that you need. We have shorts, shirts, flip-flops, towels, everything. If you didn't come prepared, we, we can get you baptized today so that you can proclaim the faith that you have in Jesus. So your what now today is this, is make a commitment to follow Christ today. Make him the Lord and Savior of your life and then commit to spending time with him by reading his words, the true words of God. So let's pray and then we're gonna worship together. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for your son, Father. And Lord, we just thank you that we get to be here today on Father's Day to celebrate what a good father you are. And God, we, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for the things that you have spoke through those 40 men. God, I ask that you would use those words to speak to us, that you would use those words to help us and direct us and guide us in our lives. And God, I pray, Lord, that from this moment on, we can move forward knowing that what you spoke, the words that are written in the Bible, are the true words from you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. 
Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.